Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Architecture Lecture Series here at CCA, the California College of the Arts. I'm Jonathan Massey, Director of the Division, and I'm really glad to see a great mix of students, faculty, and colleagues from beyond uh, campus here tonight for a lecture by David Benjamin. Many of our students and faculty, as I think folks know, work at the intersection of architecture and design with art and technology. Our expertise in this area comes from working with colleagues in other CCA programs, since we have a design division and fine arts and humanities and sciences colleagues here. It also comes from collaboration with leaders in, uh, in other sectors of society and in industry. This year, for instance, students are working with and learning from experts at Audi, Autodesk, and Chrysler and Associates, among other companies, in their studios and outside their studios as we uh, as we try to reimagine the ways that we design and uh, realize architecture and buildings. I like to think of CCA and my somewhat fantastical geography as the halfway point between Silicon Valley and Black Rock City. And I look forward to seeing how we can continue uh, to develop our capacity to, to, to position architecture uh, in, that, in that kind of realm. And to learn more about what we're doing right now in, in, that, uh, in that kind of area, please come back next Monday for the Creative Architecture Machines Colloquium, at which architects and industry innovators will consider the impact of robotics on the way we design and make buildings. That event will start a little bit earlier uh, because it's a colloquium involving a lot of folks, but it'll be right here uh, on Monday, November 3rd. And come back again on Saturday, February 7th for the Data Clay Colloquium, which will explore how digital methods are transforming ceramics as a medium for fine art, architecture, and design. Those are, uh, those are upcoming public programs in, in, in that, that same stream uh, that will be complemented, of course, by lectures and panels on a range of other uh, topics as well next semester. Tonight's speaker, David Benjamin, is working in adjacent territory through concepts, prototypes, artworks, and installations from the furniture to the building scale. David shows how architecture and design can use information to remake ecologies and environments. You've probably seen the mycological pavilion he installed this summer at PS1 in New York. Let me tell you a bit more about his background and accomplishments before handing over the podium. David is an assistant professor of architecture at Columbia University in the Graduate School of Architecture Planning and Preservation, where he also directs the Living Architecture Lab since 2006. He's also founder and principal of a practice called The Living, uh, which he started in 2011. He holds uh, architecture degrees uh, or an architecture degree from Columbia and an undergraduate degree from Harvard University. He's received numerous awards, uh, most recently the Museum of Modern Arts PS1 Young Architects Program, uh, which allowed him to build that mushroom pavilion, um, an Emerging Voices Prize from the Architectural League in New York, uh, and awards from New York Foundation for the Arts, the AIA, the American Society of Landscape Architects, the Van Allen Institute, and many other organizations, including Autodesk, uh, which awarded him an Idea Studio Fellowship uh, in 2011, and which recently purchased his, his firm. Uh, David has exhibited his work at galleries, museums, events, and festivals. He's published essays and chapters in books. His projects has have been widely featured and profiled in magazines, books, and uh, and and other venues, um, and he is active also as a as an author and editor, contributing to our understanding of of topics like building intelligence, parametric design, and the relationship between architecture and biology. He has lectured widely at schools, museums, conferences, and summits from Manitoba to Madrid and Moscow, including CCA, where he spoke in 2008. Please join me in welcoming back David Benjamin. Uh, well, thank you, Jonathan, for that very uh, generous introduction. Um, it's great to be here at CCA. I, I feel a kind of um, 
a kinship to this place and to the type of um, experiments and designs um, and, uh, and approach uh, that I think uh, the school has. Um, and it, it's partly with that in mind um, that I want to describe um, some of the latest thinking that we've been doing at our studio, The Living, um, about design as an ecosystem. Um, we also think about designing e ecosystems, um, but what I really want to focus on tonight is how design itself for us is a kind of, uh, is a kind of ecosystem with interconnected loops, uh, loops that uh, are related to technologies, culture, uh, people, non-humans, uh, natural environment across multiple scales, connecting our work to work in the past, and hopefully um, leaving some um, open-ended loops for our work to connect to and relate to work in the future. Um, we've been thinking about this more and more as an important um, part of, of what defines us as a, as a studio. Um, and what allows us to continue doing our experiments and, and kind of pushing them out into the world as open-ended tests. Um, so uh, with this kind of um, circular approach in mind, I actually um, want to start at the end um, and uh, show a video um, that's uh, a video of one of our most recent projects with which Jonathan uh, already introduced. This is a project called Hi-Fi for uh, the Museum of Modern Art and MoMA PS1 in New York. And I'm going to start by showing this video, which was kind of a culmination of a lot of our thinking over the past several years, uh, uh, loosely corresponding to our thinking about design uh, since we were last here um, at CCA. Um, and then uh, I want to use, uh, use this video as a kind of um, as a kind of milestone um, of where we are now and, and then explain uh, a little bit about how we got here and some of the experiments along the way. Oops, that was not what I wanted to do. This was a project uh, that was in, in some ways about a new material, uh, reinventing uh, a new type of architectural brick. Um, it's a project uh, that was also about a new approach to design, uh, sustainable design. 
um, and a way of uh, thinking about uh, uh, manufacturing our building materials and making our buildings with uh, almost no waste, almost no energy required, and almost no carbon emissions. Um, but more than anything, uh, in a way, it was a project that was uh, about being designed to disappear uh, more than it was being designed to appear. Um, I'm going to come back to what I mean by that in, in a second. Um, but first, I want to kind of review um, a number of different projects, um, six different projects and six different kind of design approaches um, that have been informing us and that are still informing us uh, uh, now. Um, number zero, because it kind of is the foundation for all of our work, is, is prototyping. Um, and in many ways, this is summarized by an approach that we invented a few years ago called flash research. And this is a, uh, an approach to architecture that's defined by self-imposed constraints, a limited budget of $1,000 or less, limited time of three months or less, um, but that nevertheless uh, tries to explore a new architectural idea um, by um, creating full-scale functioning prototypes of that idea. Um, this gives you a sense of the working method um, of flash research. We basically challenge ourselves to make about a prototype a week. Each prototype um, is small. It takes on a very small part of the, of the whole project, um, and the prototypes build off of each other incrementally. But um, this is a method that we've found helpful to um, think big, um, to be kind of futuristic and utopian, um, but to work with uh, real materials on the lab bench to get our hands dirty. Uh, one of the examples of this kind of approach, this flash research approach, uh, is called living glass. And this project started with the material. Some of you may know. You, you may have experimented with it yourselves. Um, it's called shape memory alloy, or sometimes it's called muscle wire. And this is basically a thin uh, wire that contracts along its length when you apply electricity to it. Um, we did a series of prototypes with this material. And uh, at the end of three months, came up uh, with this, uh, which is a thin, transparent surface um, that opens and closes uh, gills uh, in the surface. Um, and another way of looking at it is that it's a substitute for glass um, that you can breathe into and it kind of breathes back at you. Here it's uh, being triggered by a carbon dioxide sensor and you can see how these thin uh, shape memory alloy uh, wires which are cast inside this surface um, can cause uh, the the envelope, the, the glass, to open up. We think this is interesting not only for controlling airflow in a room, um, but for making visible the invisible conditions of the environment. We like to document these types of projects, especially flash research, um, through not only photographs of you know the kind of final output, um, but also through things like circuit diagrams, uh, source code, and instruction manuals. Here are two examples of instruction manuals uh, that we created for flash research projects. Um, and this allows others to, uh, to kind of pick up where we left off and take it in an entirely new direction. <laughs> These are our students at Columbia, and they created um, a project called the Huggy Wall. Completely different idea about space, completely different uh, you know, envelope materials, but similarly activated by that same shape memory alloy. Um, we used that uh, approach um, to explore a new type of project that was uh, very interested in how uh, sensors are embedded in our buildings. This is getting more and more commonplace. Buildings are getting more sophisticated, but typically they stand alone. And we had the hypothesis that maybe buildings could start sharing their sensor with data with one another um, and creating a kind of ecosystem of information. We applied our prototyping approach here and built a kind of low-tech version of this. Uh, we had some custom sensors uh, that we created. Uh, we wrote some very simple computer code to uh, process the data from those sensors. And we created a kind of larger installation um, of this breathing building skin. 
Um, here's uh, what the sensors looked like. These are wireless sensors, so we connected some carbon uh, monoxide and nitrogen dioxide sensors to a battery and a radio. We got these small boxes that were wireless. They were collecting air quality data and sending them uh, to a local home base. We installed them uh, on the inside and the outside of a few different buildings in New York and also here in San Francisco. Here's the Empire State Building and uh, I think the 18th floor where we installed um, some of these. Um, and then all of the uh, sensors from multiple buildings were sending their data uh, to the internet and basically back to a single building that was processing information. Um, and what we thought was interesting about this is that we could allow a building to act not only on local data but on remote data. Um, if buildings can share their sensor data with one another, then each building can act um, with a uh, a kind of more sophisticated ecosystem of information. We did this project in 2008, I think, and it was, uh, it was early on for this uh, kind of work with uh, embedded sensors and buildings and communicating via the internet. Now um, this is much more common, but still we think there's an insight in this um, type of approach, as low tech as it seems now, um, that could be valuable for us today. And that's basically just to ask um, if we can act on a lot of information, if each building can um, act on not only its own sensor data but other, bu other buildings' data, um, then what, what would we do? Or in other words, if buildings could, could talk to a, a one another, what would they say? Um, we think that's an important question, and that's part of the reason that we do these experiments with these new technologies, is to, to start exploring these questions, not just to demonstrate the technology themselves, but to ask these kinds of, uh, ask, ask these kinds of questions. One hypothesis that we came up with uh, back then, and I still think it's um, a, a relevant uh, thing to think about, is um, if buildings could share their sensor data with one another, then perhaps buildings could share their real-time energy use with one another. And if buildings could do that, then maybe there could be a kind of um, bottom-up intelligence in the city as a whole. In other words, um, if each building could schedule some of its um, non-time-sensitive energy use, such as turning on the air conditioner, if, if each building could schedule that based on a knowledge of what all the other buildings were doing, then there could be a kind of cooperative community of buildings. Why would that help? Because um, most uh, uh, sizing of power plants is dependent on peak load. So if, we can, if each building can act with knowledge of what the other buildings are doing, uh, then we could potentially reduce peak load. Buildings can schedule their use when other buildings aren't using it and therefore we could um, reduce the need for some of the power plants, especially some of the dirtier uh, coal-fired power plants. Um, so these are the kind of um, things we think about. We're tinkering with these tiny sensors, holding something in our hand, working with what available resources we have, just a, you know, a lab bench, a desk, um, but we're trying to think about ideas that might change you know, how, how buildings are designed, how cities are, are uh, used and made. Um, Okay, number one, design with information. This is a project that um, picked up where the, where the previous one left off in many ways. This is a project for Seoul, South Korea. Um, and Seoul is a city, like many cities in the world, that has um, fluctuating air quality. You can see two pictures here um, taken from the same vantage point on different days, and obviously one day had uh, better air quality than the other day. Um, the city already has um, some very interesting real-time interfaces to air quality. On the left, you see a billboard that's displaying real-time PM10, an important uh, contributor to bad air quality. Um, and on the right-hand side, uh, you see a, a website uh, that's displaying real-time and past data about uh, different neighborhoods in the city. Uh, this blue thing is the map of the city of Seoul. Um, Seoul also has an interesting uh, kind of building culture uh, right now, which is uh, that there are a lot of new buildings that are being created with uh, multicolored dynamic LEDs. Often these are showing patterns, um, sometimes flowers in the building on the lower left. You probably know the building. Um, 
And our hypothesis here was, um, what if we could combine both of these? What if we could create a dynamic building facade that was displaying not just pattern, um, but information about our environment? Um, for this project, uh, we started with the map of the city. We located uh, 25 air quality sensors run by the government. We redrew the map according to air quality boundaries rather than uh, political boundaries or geographic boundaries. And then we bent this kind of new version of a map of the city of Seoul into a canopy, um, a, a roof um, for an installation in a public park uh, in the city. Um, and this allowed us um, to experiment with you know, a physical interface in the city. We imagine it as a, a, a pavilion which represents a future building facade in the city. Um, and we think it's, um, it was an interesting test for us for an idea about what the, the bigger building facades in the city and, and therefore the skyline of the city uh, might eventually become. Um, so basically this was a, a permanent pavilion in a public park um, that was dynamic, that was changing, glowing and blinking um, according to both objective data about uh, things like environmental quality, but also more subjective uh, information like public interest in the environment. So more specifically, it worked in three ways. First, um, it's a display of air quality improvement. Um, and the way this worked is that um, each neighborhood, which uh, you can see here represented by the different shapes of panels, each neighborhood um, lights up when its air quality is better now than a year ago. So it's a comparison between a single neighborhood now and in the past. Second, every hour the map goes dark and the panels or the neighborhoods illuminate in order of best current air quality to worst. So this is a comparison right now between neighborhoods. The first is one neighborhood over time. This is right now a comparison between neighborhoods. Um, and third and probably most interesting and important for us is that it's a, a kind of a measurement of public interest in the environment. So we um, put together this kind of a custom uh, hotline where you can send in a text message with a postal code. Um, the, post, the neighborhood corresponding to that postal code will blink twice and then you receive back some real-time information um, about air quality in that neighborhood. Um, so what's kind of interesting here to us is that we're connecting our ecosystem of personal information, um, the kind of thing that we normally get on our mobile phone, the kind of thing that's somehow informing us about, um, about ourself in the city, in the world. Um, we're combining that with a public interface. So in other words, if you are walking in this park and you see this um, pavilion blinking, then you know that uh, someone else in the city is interested in air quality right now. If you see a lot of blinking at certain times of day, you know that our collective interest, our public interest uh, in air quality is peaking at that moment. If you see one neighborhood blinking more than others, you know that more people are requesting information about that neighborhood. So it's making a, a kind of collective uh, interface of uh, something that seems important to this issue um, of environmental quality, uh, which is our public interest in it. Um, like all uh, installations, you know, you put it out in the city and you never know exactly um, how it's going to be used. Um, but this was one interesting test for us in taking some of our experiments from the lab bench and making it, you know, a permanent structure in a very public place. And this was an important turn for us. Two, design with environment. So this is a project that we were doing uh, right about at the same time as the one in, in Seoul um, about air quality, but this was about water quality and it was in the city of New York, more specifically in the East River. Um, this project has now uh, become um, uh, a, a 200 foot long floating pier uh, in the East River that will be constructed early next year. Um, and this is, of course, just a rendering of what it's going to be like. Um, but this is to say um, that our small prototype, which I'm about to show, um, grew into this vision and kind of um, 
was convincing enough as a proof of concept um, to go from a small um, nonprofit funded kind of art installation to a permanent part of the public infrastructure of the city. Um, but really we started here, which was with the idea that um, what would be an interesting thing to contribute to this idea of um, sensors out in the city, contributing to the, the idea of the Internet of Things before it was called that, um, would be to put these kind of things where they aren't uh, already. And uh, our idea here was to put them out in the water. Um, and more specifically, we wanted to um, create this floating array or floating network uh, of tubes. Each tube is six feet tall. We wanted to put these out in the water, um, have half of it below water and half above water, and have uh, there be sensors below water and lights, dynamic lights above water. Um, we again worked with uh, this kind of um, uh, you know, homemade electronics uh, uh, type of design palette that, you know, I think probably a lot of people are familiar with. Um, but the real idea for us was to, to kind of create this open-ended experiment um, and to test it out in the city. Uh, this is a, a fish, uh, fish sensor um, hacking into, a, you know, a device used by uh, people going fishing. Um, to detect something important about the environment, which is presence of fish. We were also detecting dissolved oxygen as a measurement of water quality. And again, we were using a mobile phone interface just through uh, simple SMS uh, exchanges. Um, really, if, if, if nothing else, this was a test of a new layer of dynamic lights in the city, you know, having a conversation with other lights in the city. Um, and we put this small network of lights um, out in the East River in New York, uh, uh, right on the uh, Manhattan side, uh, just north of where the Manhattan Bridge uh, meets Manhattan. Um, and, you know, we have a, a network of, of floating lights that looks like this. Um, but really, it's, it's kind of um, an experiment about this relationship. So in the background, you see... Um, a famous building that also has dynamic lights. Um, this building uh, changes its color of lights uh, about once a day, and it signals things like uh, holidays and Mariah Carey concerts. Um, and our layer of dynamic lights in the city is changing you know, many times a second, and it's signaling things like um, water quality, um, presence of marine life in the environment, and um, interaction or again public interest in this important issue like the environment um, you know to make this happen of course we we worked you know on the same type of lab bench here you see a, a sense of these lights as we're kind of testing them out testing the the way they can blink and change colors the way we can use a simple uh, computer control system um, here we're st staging the installation getting ready to install it um, the lights are uh, able to change color and blink. Just two simple things, um, but that's actually a, a way that we're experimenting with communicating and having public interfaces, basically imagining that we're filtering data, that we don't necessarily need to give data in high resolution, but sometimes a low resolution filtered data is more interesting and important. Um, here's a more or less real-time uh, time-lapse video where you can see a um, uh, a, a kind of tipping point. The lights go from reddish color to a bluish color, and that's because of a tipping point in the water quality. Um, red color indicates that the water quality is worse than a week ago, and blue indicates that it's better than a week ago. Um, but as you see, our, uh, our kind of incremental prototyping approach uh, uh, kind of take hold here in each of our projects, um, I want to describe uh, one aspect that we're adding to the new, bigger installation that we'll be uh, uh, creating and, and prototyping this fall, and that's to basically add uh, biosensors uh, to digital sensors. Um, here you see a tank of mussels, living uh, shellfish, you know, uh, the same kind that we eat. 
Um, and the movement here um, that you see, you see this kind of pulsing of this community of muscles, that's the muscles opening and closing their shells. Um, and it turns out um, that muscles open and close their shells at a rate and an amount that is actually a very sensitive and sophisticated detector of pollution in the water. In fact, in some ways, uh, more sophisticated and uh, a better detector than any of our uh, digital sensors. Um, so you can basically take um, some existing live muscles. Um, you can uh, put a $2 Hall effect sensor on the shell of a muscle and a magnet on the other shell of a muscle, and then uh, connect a simple wire uh, to that sensor, and then you can basically use and harness um, the natural intelligence of muscles that have evolved over you know, thousands, tens of thousands, potentially millions of years um, to, to do this thing which helps their survival but turns out can give us important information about the environment. And we can register that and record that and use that as a, a tool for public interface. Um, so in, in a way here we're experimenting with an idea that uh, we can combine some of our um, you know, much hyped tools of artificial intelligence or all these computer systems we're fascinated with uh, with a kind of biological intelligence or natural intelligence and use them um, in new ways together. Uh, we did the first test installation of this at the Venice Biennale a, a couple years ago. Um, and now we're bringing this uh, to our installation in the East River in New York. Three, design with personal communication. So um, you probably see in some of uh, the progression of the work uh, um, a, an idea of building off of uh, our previous projects, um, but also I hope you see um, a kind of restlessness or an, an interest in filling the holes rather than um, perfecting one loop. Um, and so when we had a chance to do an installation um, for a, a Biennale in Shenzhen, China, and Hong Kong, we, didn't, we wanted to uh, uh, try something new, not do something necessarily about environmental quality, but still engage this idea that we we're you know, still working on about communication and uh, digital uh, uh, information in the city. So um, the way this worked out is we started with two features that we um, thought were very interesting and unique to these two cities, Shenzhen and Hong Kong. One is street food, this amazing culture of um, eating out on the street uh, with your neighbors. Um, in many uh, business districts and many districts throughout these two cities, uh, when the storefronts close down uh, at the end of the day, um, there's this incredible transformation and out of nowhere appear uh, these stalls that uh, prepare and serve street food and people um, eat that street food right there on the street um, and there's a kind of civic life, a kind of street life uh, of these cities through this, uh, through this uh, necessity of food. Um, the cities both uh, also uh, brought to mind for us uh, the manufacture of electronics. A lot of our low-cost electronics, such as LEDs, um, uh, is, is done in these cities, and also a lot of manufacture of high-cost electronics, uh, like cell phones, is done there, too. Um, and we thought, you know, what can we do here um, to engage both of these? And we thought, um, ah, of course, let's design a, a soup bowl. Um, and so here uh, what we did was uh, take um, the simple white plastic soup bowls that are already in use in these uh, street food stalls, um, used CNC milling not to make some um, creative interesting form but to carve out a very precise little pocket in the bottom of these soup bowls. Um, we took some scrolling LED badges um, that are manufactured in Shenzhen you know, you've seen something like this before, I'm sure. Um, figured out a way to um, program in uh, custom messages into these uh, scrolling LED badges and, and invited um, international curators um, who were attending this um, art and architecture biennale 
um, to create provocations, small observations or almost like mini manifestos uh, about the city. Um, and this was all in service of a crazy idea of um, putting these messages in the bottom of soup bowls, hiding them there so that no one would suspect. And then partnering uh, with some of uh, these uh, local street food vendors to serve noodle soups um, out, of, out of our bowls. Um, so this was, you know, in a way, uh, you know, an, an odd project. Um, uh, but it was really about um, thinking about how we can um, cut through this mass amount of information, all of this, uh, all of this uh, kind of digital data about our city, all of these messages, all of this advertising. How can we cut through that um, and offer something new, something interesting? Well, one is with context, with serving this stuff um, uh, in with adding this layer of information uh, to something a little bit unexpected like food. Um, but also um, we thought it was important to connect this international community of curators um, who were writing messages like this, having a discussion like this, um, to connect them to the life of the city, um, to have this strange micro exchange um, between um, one group and another, um, and in other words, to bring the Biennale from the, the kind of um, gallery or the you know, civic hall out into the streets. Um, a, something that we realized about this project is that it was um, a strange combination. It was at once um, personal and public. Um, and in the end, as we kind of developed it, we realized um, that there were some, some interesting uh, ways to work with uh, digital information in the city, including surprise and humor. Um, and of course, as you see here, um, the, the, real, the real trick is that you would not see this, uh, this scrolling message initially when you had a bowl full of soup and noodles, um, but gradually it would um, reveal itself to you. You might first think, hmm, that's strange, what's going on? And then eventually you see the message. Four, design with ecosystems. So um, we also started to think and realize that something important about the um, the information in the city, um, the life of the city, the technologies of the city, um, is that they're not um, completely controllable um, and that that's interesting and it might be um, a good thing and that certainly as designers we were interested in, you know, how should we work with that? Um, how should we understand that? So this was really a project about thinking of ways to um, design ecosystems so not design um, you know, single static built objects, but design ecosystems. Uh, and we started off uh, with a jar of honey. Um, I'm sure people have seen this. If you take honey on a spoon and you drop it back into the jar, instead of just creating a kind of lump, it creates a coiling effect. And that's because it's a viscous liquid and it has interesting material properties. Well, if you drop um, a viscous liquid um, such as honey, or in this case, um, melted recycled plastic, if you drop it onto a conveyor belt, um, then it can create interesting patterns. If the conveyor belt is going pretty fast, you get a straight line. If the conveyor belt is going slower, you get a kind of wavy line. Um, and if the conveyor belt is going even slower, you get much more complex patterns uh, like figure eights. Um, and so, we thought this was interesting as a way to um, create a, a somewhat predetermined um, possibility of shapes, but part of the detail of the shape was, was being um, played out through this kind of material intelligence. And this was a system that, you know, it's, it, it, you could hardly call this a, a, 
a robotic or CNC system, but it, it was a system with one variable, the speed of the conveyor belt, um, and that would create a kind of dynamic form over time. Much less top-down um, than most of our CNC technologies, but you know, nevertheless, you know, it is in a way computer numerically controlled. Um, so we took this synthetic material, this melted plastic, and we combined it with another ingredient, a natural material of moss. Remember, we're trying to design an ecosystem here. We're trying to design some rules um, of how things can go together. But, you know, in our typical prototyping approach, we're starting slow, just using um, a couple of ingredients, um, a couple of factors. So we had these two factors, uh, or two ingredients, uh, the synthetic material, this melted plastic, layering up over time. The natural material, the moss, layering up over time. They were kind of competing against each other because they're being um, aggregated in the same um, place. And they're both being driven um, by one variable. Each one is being driven by a variable. And that variable is coming from real-time web searches for terms like environment and construction. So the more searches for environment, the more uh, the moss would be given a chance to um, aggregate and beat out the plastic. The more searches for construction, uh, the more the other, uh, the other would happen, the plastic would uh, aggregate. Um, so it was basically a way of us taking these three things, uh, uh, basically construction, vegetation, and ideas. The ideas are the data that's driving this thing. Um, and setting up a system, an ecosystem, that will play out for 30 days without us touching it. So we basically design the rules, design the ecosystem, but we don't design the form. Um, and we think this was interesting, not only because we were curious, you know, what would happen, but because we thought this was, um, a first step in starting to explore design with uncertainty, design with incomplete control, um, design with shifting and unknowable forces, you know, things that would um, happen um, that we couldn't, uh, that we couldn't um, foresee and that we couldn't um, change from the top down. We just had to set up the rules and then let the system play out. Um, this was a 30-day installation. Here you see um, uh, about the first uh, 12 days. You see, like most ecosystems, a kind of equilibrium, this um, cylinder-like form aggregating over time. Um, this thing is just building day and night. Um, and then, for a variety of reasons, um, including a strange blip in the data, a tipping point in the data, um, there was a tipping point in the material and a kind of moment of chaos, a disequilibrium. But like many ecosystems, uh, there developed then um, a more complex equilibrium again, um, this kind of uh, banding effect where these thicker bands um, started weaving themselves together. Um, and, and this was a, a, a total discovery to us. Um, you know, we, we never could have, and uh, and never did set out to design this type of aggregation. Um, but we kind of discovered it over time. Um, and although, you know, this may seem a little bit um, theoretical and, you know, uh, hypothetical, um, we now see this, you know, this was a project from uh, about three years ago. Uh, we now see this um, as uh, very related to discussions about designing uh, with resilience um, and with the concept anti-fragile, with trying to design systems or be aware of systems and harness systems that get better with stress rather than um, being threatened by stress. Um, designing systems that will um, improve over time or have the capacity to adapt Five, design with evolution. Um, so this is uh, a project um, uh, that we've been working on for a while um, in a few different forms. Um, we've done a lot of collaborations with Autodesk on this project uh, even before we were such close partners. Um, and I want to um, I want to show actually a few different uh, chapters of this project. Um, and the first chapter is related to um, uh, 
a lot of our work over the past several years uh, with biology. Our thinking here is that, of course, biologists, if, sorry, of course, designers and architects uh, have been fascinated by biology uh, for many years, um, including, you know, the way that uh, we've been fascinated by this book on growth and form by Darcy Wentworth Thompson for many years. Um, but the idea here, our thinking here, and, and we're not unique, many people think this, is that um, biology of today, biology of the past couple years, is very different than biology uh, 100 years ago. Um, and this is there uh, for many reasons. Um, we're now able to do something like you just uh, saw there, which is grow cells outside of a living organism in a tiny glass chip by feeding them nutrients in very specific ways. Uh, we're able to image biology. We're able to capture it in photographs and videos in ways that we couldn't before. And this allows us to see things like the incredible branching, spanning uh, growth uh, of algae. Uh, we're able to capture something like this, which is the growth of slime mold, and think about how we can apply it at a totally different scale to help create better railway networks or highway networks. It turns out there's a biological intelligence in the growth of slime mold that's relevant at a totally different scale. Um, we're able to capture something like this and understand it more. This is uh, uh, several tadpole embryos uh, growing at the same time, and you see this incredible robust uh, way in which they all uh, synchronize and develop in the same way. Um, this is a living tadpole, and you can see the, the working of its brain, its neural system. You can see its heart beating there. And this is through new technology that allows that kind of visualization through uh, this thing called quantum dots. So all of this is, is very new. This is a video of stem cells um, signaling to each other and, and determining what fate to become, whether to become heart, liver, uh, bone, etc. Um, and finally, we can take something like this, which is this you know, incredible three-dimensional form in the growth of a colony of bacteria about the size of a quarter, and we can apply some techniques of, of computation to it, things like computer vision and machine learning, to try to understand this incredible biological organism uh, in new ways, to try to capture something about what's happening here. Um, to try to gather some information about it, some data about it, but maybe eventually um, create some, some models, some ways that we can understand this enough to harness it and use it for our own designs. Um, for a couple years, I've been working with a synthetic biologist named Fernand Federici um, through an NSF-funded uh, project that paired synthetic biologists with designers. Uh, designers defined very broadly. Some were musicians, uh, some artists, uh, some industrial designers, and uh, I was an architect in this mix. Um, so Fernand is a plant biologist, and we had the very open-ended challenge of creating uh, an interesting project that, that combined our, our different interests. Um, we started with this, which is uh, confocal microscope uh, photography, the ability to um, image tiny, tiny uh, cells and organisms um, and then recomposite them into um, three-dimensional shapes like this that we can use in the computer. Um, and then potentially create um, models that are more like our design models. So we started with that. Um, idea. Um, but what we came to was basically the, the possibility that we could um, feed in a bunch of data, a bunch of low resolution data into a spreadsheet like this about the growth of this organism, um, use some existing computer tools. This is an amazing um, tool coming out of Cornell University and the lab of Hodlipson that allows you to feed in a data set, any Excel sheet, and generate an equation out of it. And then, and this is most important, figure out how to capture something about the biological organism of xylem cell growth um, and then apply it in new conditions uh, that never happened in nature. Um, so we basically figured out how to create a center line, this blue line, and generate a lattice 
um, around it, and then we can change the blue center line and then generate a new lattice. So um, you don't typically see xylem cells in an L shape, but we can simulate a low resolution version of that um, because of our computer model and our um, good data gathering techniques. So important to note that we couldn't do this um, alone in our, you know, kind of tinkering on our lab bench. This is, um, you know, one strategy we've been using very recently, which is um, collaborating. In fact, we've been using it all along, but now we've uh, started developing these uh, very high-powered collaborators in different fields, such as synthetic biology and computer science, mechanical engineering, who can allow us to achieve more than a tinkering approach, we hope. Um, so one way that we've been applying that recently is to think about new ways to design things. You know, on the left you see a typical design approach, you know, the way that you might design a chair um, by creating the stick figure of a chair and slowly uh, uh, refining the details. Um, but what if you designed in a slightly different way? Design uh, some part of the chair, like the seat, where you know what you want, and then some part of the chair, like the legs, where you want to explore the design space through a combination of uh, a, a biology-based algorithm, like the xylem algorithm, um, plus um, computational techniques. Um, so we created this model, um, which was loosely defined on the xylem growth, which allows us um, to um, populate a field of points, connect them into a kind of exoskeleton like the xylem cell, and create um, a possible system of legs for a chair. Um, but the great thing about the system, like many parametric models, is that you can change a few parameters and generate a completely different uh, iteration. Um, for each iteration, you can evaluate it or score it. In this case, we're using um, structure as a score. So you can kind of see um, how one uh, chair scores as being you know, uh, strong enough to sit on and how another uh, scores. And then we use this technique that we've been experimenting with in a lot of scenarios, not only chairs, but to use the power of automated computation to generate thousands, tens of thousands, even uh, hundreds of thousands of design iterations, each one shown here by a point in the data, um, and evolve them over time. So you allow the best of biological algorithms, the best of uh, computing techniques, you know, what a computer is good at automating these steps to help you explore a huge space of possible chair designs um, and then um, hone in on ones that might, just might, um, be both high performing and unexpected. And that's the key to us. We're looking for ways to design things that are good, that we like, that work for various reasons of human judgment. Um, but that we wouldn't have come to with our normal, linear, human thinking um, that go beyond our preconceptions. Um, and of course, as we all know, it's possible to program into these algorithms constraints about manufacturability. So we can explore different chair designs, um, use the computer to help um, evaluate them, um, and then translate directly into fabrication. Um, the bottom line here, um, again, you know, using a kind of simple um, approach uh, uh, to demonstrate the proof of concept is um, it's just the start, but it's basically saying model one, traditional design, solid legs for a chair. Model two, with 3D printing, you can make tiny lattice bars. But model three, the most interesting, is you can create entirely new compositions that you wouldn't have thought of otherwise. Now here we're just using two metrics. Here we're just using two ways of thinking about a chair, structure and amount of material, but what's exciting for us is the approach can be expanded. Eventually, and, and even um, in the near future, we can use this approach to start designing for, um, for more interesting um, and less predictable things like what's a good design for both public space and rentability um, of a new mixed-use development, right? So the, the techniques um, can help us solve more interesting problems, but the first proof of concept um, is something like this, a chair. Um, 
and six, and this is the last project, and here I'm coming full circle, um, is, uh, is an approach to uh, kind of designing without uh, instead of designing with. Um, so this approach um, and this project was continuing some of our interest in designing ecosystems, um, continuing some of our research in uh, new materials and really um, kind of getting our hands on new materials and thinking about the combination between uh, material and form. Um, but this approach uh, uh, also was an experiment in, in a new way of, uh, of thinking about how uh, we make buildings. Um, so um, as people you know, already know, but I'm going to frame it in a certain way, um, a lot of our uh, buildings and you know, our cities and our built environment is uh, pretty unsustainable. So on the top of the page, you see a version of the, this unsustainable loop. It starts with this red circle, which is the Earth's uh, natural, healthy carbon cycle. Um, a cycle of growth, decay, renewal, and regrowth um, that can uh, happen over and over again. And you know, not not to um, fetishize it, but it's um, it's a it's pretty good as an ecosystem, right? It can last uh, on and on. Um, but most uh, of our buildings are made um, by diverting resources. These blue lines on the top, diverting resources from uh, the healthy ecosystem. Uh, putting them into building materials. Often it takes a lot of energy uh, to make those building materials, making buildings, and then at the end of the life of those buildings, those go into landfills. And uh, in the United States, something like 40% of our landfills are construction waste. Um, so this is a big problem. This, this landfill, this waste, doesn't get back into the um, cycle of the ecosystem, the carbon cycle. Um, and the hypothesis of this project was, well, could we, instead of um, uh, having this uh, unhealthy kind of linear direction of materials uh, from the healthy ecosystem into a landfill, couldn't we temporarily kind of borrow those materials, uh, make something, and then return those materials back uh, to the ecosystem? So in other words, instead of taking high-value raw materials like petroleum, like uh, rare metals, um, we would take uh, low-value raw materials. Instead of spending a lot of energy to go from raw material to building element, we said maybe we could use no energy or very little energy to go into a building block. Um, and instead of, after building something, going into the landfill, what if we could um, biodegrade that material or compost it and return it back uh, into the... Uh, into the healthy carbon cycle. Um, how would we do this? Uh, through mycelium. Um, this is a, uh, a branching uh, root-like structure in mushrooms. You can see here its growth, these white filaments reaching out um, as it grows. And this is, of course, a microscope video. Um, and um, there's a lot of research, well, a little bit of research now, um, in using this uh, process, this natural growth, to create um, valuable uh, products. So uh, this is a video from uh, the facility of our partner, Ecovative, in upstate New York, an interesting startup. And it's basically showing how you can take the waste of agriculture, um, combine it with mycelium, pack it into a mold of any shape. Um, and here this shows five days in a time lapse the mycelium, these white filaments, grow and bind together the agricultural waste, um, and you create solid objects. Um, so um, this is uh, a, a really interesting process to us because it suggests that we can actually grow uh, new uh, building blocks. Uh, we can do that with uh, waste, with corn stalks, not the high-value part of, uh, of agriculture, not the corn kernels, but the corn stalks. Uh, and we can create things like bricks or other solid objects um, uh, with, very, uh, with very little waste, very little energy required, and almost no carbon emissions. Um, these things grow into solid objects uh, uh, at room temperature. They can grow in the dark. They don't even require sunlight. And so it's a way of creating something valuable, creating a, a building block, a brick, um, 
in this, uh, in this healthy way. Um, here is uh, an example of the, the brick that we designed. Um, and uh, we basically had the hypothesis um, that we could use this mycelium material, um, which some people had been working with for a little while, um, to create uh, a structure um, that was outdoors, um, that was testing out the scalability of this building material, um, and that was really kind of pushing the limits, seeing how far we could go um, with this new material um, in an architectural setting. Um, of course, we had to do some testing here. This is uh, a testing lab at Columbia University. We're applying uh, gradually more and more and more force um, to this brick. And of course, that doesn't seem like a great result for a building material. Um, this brick has gone from about four inches to about uh, three quarters of an inch. Um, but uh, our great structural engineers at Arup, who worked very closely with us on this project, um, uh, helped us see how um, this, this could actually be very interesting. So uh, one, although that looked like a terrible result, crushing the brick that uh, much, that was the force of 100,000 pounds. Um, in our final structure, our bricks are taking about 250 pounds. Um, so that that's an extreme test, right? That's a testing machine that tests, um, you know, some of the biggest structures that you know people make. Um, and we were taking it to its extreme. Um, although the material crushed that much, it actually didn't crack or break, and that's actually very different than concrete or most uh, other materials. So uh, what this is showing us is that. You know, this is a new sustainable material, of course, um, but it's also a material that suggests new structural properties and new possibilities. It won't necessarily be a drop-in substitute for some of our other building materials, but it is uh, potentially a useful and interesting uh, building material. So two facts about this uh, brick. A single brick um, can take the weight of up to 50 cars, um, but on the other hand, the material is 200,000 times uh, softer than steel. So what can you do with this? Well, we took that data from that test, um, uh, fed it into the computer model uh, that Arup uh, was evaluating. They gave us back some uh, results. Uh, we did several rounds of revising both the brick shape and the overall tower shape, um, and then uh, used a series of other strategies. This one is uh, using um, kind of iterative computer process to um, lay out the bricks uh, in our uh, unusual complex form. Um, the problem here is that uh, if you were making this structure out of normal bricks, you could uh, get to the end of a row and cut the brick. This material, uh, it loses its stability when you cut it. So we had to figure out how do you create uh, this series of perimeter rings, these courses of brick, where each one is a different length, where they're twisting, where they're leaning off of each other um, with the smallest number of possible um, standardized parts. Um, we started with a whole brick, but we ran into some trouble. If you just only have one whole brick type, um, you run out of space sometimes, you don't have enough bearing area. We introduced a half brick and that helped. And then we also had to introduce a quarter brick. So this is using a computer um, to test out how to lay out the bricks such that every row um, is the right length and so that every brick sits properly on two other bricks. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm showing this partly to give you the sense of the um, testing that we did. And in this project, you know, although it was a kind of... Um, a, a type of scale um, uh, that we hadn't quite done before. Um, we were still using this iterative testing approach. We were still using um, the idea of testing just enough. We were still under a very tight time scale. There was about one month to design the project. After we found out we won the competition, we had about six weeks um, before we went into construction, and then we had about four weeks to construct it. Um, and we were learning things and reacting the whole time. We were thinking about this new material, 
um, new approaches to um, building with this material. It hadn't been um, used uh, in this way before. Um, and basically trying to test out an, an idea about, about an architectural building material, a new type of architecture, by pushing it to the limits. So this is 10,000 uh, bricks. Uh, so we're testing out the industrial scale of production here. Um, this is a brick and mortar structure. It's load bearing, uh, like other uh, traditional brick structures. Um, we did have a timber frame uh, on the inside, but that was working only for uh, hurricane force winds. Um, and we tried to test out um, size too. Uh, this is about 41 feet uh, tall, uh, all constructed in four weeks um, by a strange combination of Columbia University graduate students, all paid, I should note, and um, typical New York City brick masons. So we were not only testing this, this new material, it's an idea that started you know, somewhat locally, but then we started testing ideas about scalability of materials, um, global supply chains, and even things about labor. Um, in the end, it looked like this, and, and one of the things um, that I like to note about this project is it tested out this um, at once familiar but completely new type of structure uh, in the context of the glass and steel buildings of Manhattan and the brick buildings of Queens. Um, it was a structure um, that I like to say uh, we, we tested out not only for its technical performance, you know, we wanted to get to scale, 10,000 bricks, 40 feet, um, you know, strong enough to stand up, um, durable enough to stand uh, for the summer, um, but we also wanted to test out this material for its creative capacity. So what would it be like to stand inside it? What were the effects uh, of light and shadow, uh, of pattern, of texture? Um, and a lot of our design decisions were made with that in mind. We wanted to see, you know, could we feel uh, creative using this material? Would we like the atmosphere it created? Um, you know, would we like the way that it framed uh, the natural environment, the way that it changed over the course of the day, the way that it looked different uh, in different kinds of light? Um, and finally, in, in a fitting uh, kind of ultimate test for us, uh, as many people here probably know, um, the, the structures uh, that have been made in the courtyard of MoMA PS1 for the past 15 years of this program, the Young Architects program, um, get tested out uh, every Saturday by 5,000 people who come to see um, experimental electronic music. Um, so this was fitting for us that the structure, you know, it may have um, been, you know, a, a specific idea about a biological material, um, about harnessing um, a living organism to help you grow a material, an idea about sustainability, but in the end it had to just, you know, uh, withstand the, the age-old um, uh, forces of use by humans um, when they're not thinking too much uh, about architecture. Um, and finally, um, you know, we've, we've observed a way that um, some projects these days can kind of take on a life of their own. Um, and this connects us back to a kind of ecosystem of information. Um, in a project like this where it was in a very public setting, um, where a lot of people came to see it or saw it, whether they came to see it or not, um, we were able to kind of follow a very low resolution um, discussion about the project. Of course, some people loved it, some people hated it, but it was really interesting real-time way for us to kind of gauge this idea being out there um, in a public realm, in the public discussion. Um, what I'm showing here um, are some posts by the, the, uh, the brilliant uh, director of MoMA PS1, Klaus Biesenbach, who uh, we were um, proud but also terrified when he, when he said one of New York City's best Instagram opportunities uh, in the courtyard. So he was inviting uh, you know, more attention, more uh, either praise or criticism. We didn't know which would follow. Um, but really, I think the important thing for us was um, considering this not to be a, 
a kind of project about a single form or a demonstration of something we already knew, but an open-ended experiment that we could um, that we could get feedback about, that we could learn from, and hopefully offer offer something back about the material. Uh, in that spirit, we had the opportunity to do a second installation at the same time in the muse in the uh, lobby of the Museum of Modern Art, and we experimented with new um, types of colorings. This is um, organic compostable dye that you can actually eat, um, uh, but it creates a different kind of palette of materials, and you know we experiment with different shapes uh, as well. Um, as I mentioned before, we were very interested in designing this project as much for um, what it left behind or didn't leave behind um, as much as we were in designing it for what it was when it was there. Um, so um, we, we basically tested out this idea of kind of creating this ecosystem that goes from crops, remember this all starts with crop waste, um, the waste of agriculture, the chopped up corn stalks, from crops to construction, a new type of brick, uh, to compost, and all the way back to crops again. So um, about halfway through the summer, we took off some of the bricks from the top, we composted them, um, we brought the composted soil, or the fresh soil, back uh, to the site and planted a new round of uh, crops there. You know, very much treating this project as a way to, to learn, to put out in the, in the public uh, something about our, um, about our open-ended experiment um, and uh, to, to kind of uh, test out this idea for possible future possibilities. Thank you. <laughs>